I'm Lynn Manuel Miranda, and you're listening to Hard Knock Life. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. I am your host, Keith Chow. I'm Brittany Monet. I'm Dominic Ma. Hey, everybody. This is going to be our last podcast pre-Loki when when we start talking about another <laughs> Disney Plus series. They dropped the embargo so we can talk about it. Yeah. I have the screener. I haven't watched it, so I'm going to wait to talk about it next week. But there is a lot of other Marvel-related and, and superhero media-related stuff to talk about, so let's get into it. First of all... How are you guys doing? How are you doing, Brittany? I'm pretty great because the Marvel-related news that we're going to talk about is so very exciting for me. <laughs> but yeah, I'm doing great. Dominic, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm swell. I'm <laughs> happy to hear the spark in your voice. <laughs> I think I, I suspect I know what it's about. <laughs> I feel like people who know me should know. The only other thing that would have made you happier... I think this week is if you had gotten cast rather than the person who did get cast. So, Brittany, I'm going to leave it to you. You've been mm-hmm. you've been this character's biggest fan for as long as I've known you. Why don't you drop the big news of the week? Yes. So, Issa Rae, who's already one of my favorite actresses, is going to be voicing Jessica Drew, Spider Woman, and Into the Spider Verse Two, which I loved the first one, and that was my first like my only complaint about the first movie was like. There is no Spider Woman, so I get my wish. Um, she's going to be voiced by a black woman, which makes me excited as a fellow black woman. So I'm very excited. I don't know if they're going to do what they did with like Zoe Kravitz, how she voiced MJ, but they still drew MJ as being white. So that's my only thing is I don't know what they're going to do with actually like what she's going to look like drawn in the movie. But either way, I'm fine with it. But I know there's, you know, people who... But who cares about those people? That's not going to ruin it because Issa Rae is Spider-Woman. Like, what? I can't imagine that they would cast Issa Rae as Spider-Woman and and keep Jessica white. But as you said, they did that with Zoe Kravitz, so... I think they might. Keep her white? I'm, 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 I'm betting Jessica Drew stays white or her super vaguely Asian-coded drawn self that she is classically. But I could be wrong. I don't know. I bet like two dollars on it, not like the farm. <laughs> um, because I think I mean I think this is a good opportunity to go into some Spider Woman disambiguation because uh, character has a long history. There have been many different versions of Spider Man, a uh, Spider Woman. <laughs> there have been many different versions of all the Spider People. To my knowledge, there hasn't been a Black Spider Woman. Well, I guess to my knowledge, well, no, there is. There, there. Uh, I could be wrong. No, In the comics, I has there ever been a so. Black Spider Woman of any kind? I don't there have been so. like. For Spider Woman, if I recall correctly, in the first Spider Verse movie, Gwen Stacy right. was called Spider Woman, which she's not called in the comics, right? Like that version is at least Ghost Spider or Spider Gwen. I think Spider Verse was the first time she was actually referred to as Spider Woman. Is that correct? Or well, she refers to herself, and you know, if I may, yeah, this is where it gets tricky because some people are there are going, wait, they already had a Spider Woman in Spider Verse because they're not huge Spider nerds. I'm just gonna put Spider in front of everything just to contextualize, but. Yeah, so like, just we'll we'll get into the history of Jessica Drew, but just jumping to the Gwen Stacy part for a second. In Spider Verse, you know, she is Gwen Stacy from an alternate universe, doesn't die, and gets spider powers, and she does refer to herself as "I am the one and only Spider Woman." So she was Spider Woman for a minute. You know, when that character first started, we called her Spider Gwen, but that was kind of sort of a funny inside joke in comics because spider gwen is a really bad name (laughs) if you're keeping a secret identity it's not something you like you know jump off rooftops and go i'm spider gwen guess who i am so it's always kind of like you know a hazy area what her actual code name was for a while and it was and i guess we could default and say it was spider woman and then she got other code names and now she's generally she was gwenum for a while and now i think she's officially ghost spider i might have got some of that wrong but that's my understanding and I recall there's like a whole thing where they like had just Gwen Stacy be everybody, right? Or I don't know if that was like a merchandise thing or if that was an actual comic storyline. Because I recall there was a Gwenpool and there was a Gweno. Oh, there's, yeah, there's so totally like, Gwenpool. Okay, so there's, like, there's this thing where like there's like these multi versions of Gwen Stacy for some reason. Yeah, when they brought her back to life, they decided they were going to bring her back to life like 70 <laughs> times. Because <laughs> that went over really well. But yeah, so one hopes that 
Gwen Stacy if whether she's called Ghost Spider or Spider Hi I'm Gwen Stacy whatever her name is will also be back for the sequel. But we're probably talking we're talking about Spider Woman who is Jessica Drew in you know is sort of Spider Woman Prime in the Marvel comics and is one of Brittany's favorite characters it if you want to take it up. From there, Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's always been, I think, a tricky character when we talked about in the last like couple years of, well, where is she going to be? Because in terms of live action rights, Sony owns all the rights to the Spider characters. But because Jessica Drew's backstory is actually like super, super tied to Hydra, mm. they can't really use her because her some versions of her, when you read, it's just like her dad was like a scientist trying to save her and there's other versions where like her dad actually was a hydra scientist and he experimented on her and that's how she got her powers and she was kind of like born and raised into hydra and she also has a thing where nick fury kind of similar to black widow where nick fury gives her like the ultimatum of taking you out or you're gonna join us so i've read the brian bendez version too of that origin story which i really like personally but that's kind of Jessica yeah. Drew in a small, very nutshell of why you have not seen her in live action. Because she's been around since, like, what, the late 60s, early 70s? Right. Forever. Yeah. And they, so they probably couldn't figure out a way to do her story without tying it too much to the Hydra shield arcs that were, like, firmly in the yeah. MCU part of the universe. And, yeah, so it's always been a mystery because she's a great character, a big part of Spider-Man lore. Again, they're like, she faded out for a while, and there was another one that came up in Secret Wars, uh, the first Secret Wars, and the same issue where Spider-Man got his new costume, the symbiote costume. I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> that, was, that was like Spider-Woman 2. And then I, you started to say there is uh, Anya Corazon, who I think is one of the... You yeah, know. but I think she is now like under Spider-Girl, not Spider-Woman. Right. Right. And there are two Spider-Girls, yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> like isn't Betty Brant actually a Spider-Girl as well? Is she? Probably. I think it's some. there's some iter iteration of her as, like, a spider girl. And then there's a Jessica Drew from, like, Earth, like, or the Ultimate Earth, and she is actually a clone of Peter Parker. She looks like Jessica Drew from Earth 616, but she's actually, like, a clone in terms of powers of, like, Peter Parker. Because Jessica Drew has some of the powers that Peter does, but she has also different ones, because she has, like, her pheromone power and the photon. Yeah. Or photon, no, Venom Blast. So she is definitely much different than Peter in Earth 616. So that's why I think yeah. there's always this weird, like, what are they going to do with Jessica? Which version? And there's some of us who are like, no, we want Jessica Drew 616. Like, that's who we want. And yeah, I'm part of the give me Jessica Drew 616. That's what I'm hoping we're getting in the animated movie. Because I know in animated rights, they can kind of do whatever. So. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I think, like, as you say, it's the uh, Spider-Woman Prime is her origin story was like not really connected to the core Peter Parker story. I mean, that's just bears mentioning because a, a lot of the other spider derivatives mm -hmm. like branch out of some version of I got bit by the radioactive spider and I'm serving the spider family now, you know, like Miles Morales has has, has that. And Spider Gwen has that. Jessica Drew didn't have that. She it was. It was just something like Marvel was like, "Wow, our Spider Man character is doing great. We'll just make a very similar character who is not even like a cousin or anything." I think later they retconned it and found it like they were all from the same like Spider God source or whatever. But anyway, this is tremendously nerdy. I see, see Keith's eyes rolling over a little bit at the <laughs> not at all <laughs> at this at the Spider everything. Yeah, no, I have no tie to the the Spider Man comics just because the, the, those aren't comics. I'm overly familiar with i'm i generally know the lore you know from just its cultural zeitgeistiness but yeah the jessica drew stuff is really fascinating and, and Brittany, i've always wondered like mm -hmm. what was it about that character that you kind of clung to 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 make it your favorite character because i know like i said as long as i've known you your one goal in life was to be cast as a uh, jessica drew in a spider-man <laughs> movie so what, what was uh, what was it about that character in particular that Drew, no pun intended, drew, drew you to her. To Drew. Jessica drew you to her. <laughs> she, I always resonated with her when I first had this video game that my dad bought me. It was, called, what was it called? It was on PlayStation 2. Was it Ultimate Alliance? Oh, was it the Ultimate Alliance game? And you could pick like, 
you know, random oh, characters to play. Oh, that so, so good. So that's where <laughs> I was actually first introduced to Jessica Drew and also, ironically, Carol Danvers. But, like, my team and I, this is before I actually really dived into reading comics because I always felt like video games were safe for me as a girl, but actual comics were, like, people would be like, no. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, my dad had bought me that game. I was, like, I don't know, 15 or 16 and I would always put Carol and Jessica on my team because you get to pick your team after a certain point. So this is like my yeah. top two choices. And everyone else, I was like, eh, whatever. I'll just switch <laughs> them out depending on what I needed for that level. So that's where I first like got into like Jessica. I'm like, oh, she's cool. And I think at the time I did like minimal research and never like fully dived in. And then I was buying a Christmas present for my younger brother. And then I saw that she was actually on a cover of um, Avengers Assembled. Uh, and I picked that up and I read it and I was like, oh, she is really awesome. And then I just fell into the, I guess the, the whole... spider hole. <laughs> yeah, <a> spider hole. <laughs> <laughs> what really ended up sticking with me with her is that she's always like warring between, you know, how she was raised and born into Hydra and then trying to be better than who she was then because she did a lot of terrible things when she was working with Hydra. I think that just really stuck to me as being biracial and always feeling like you're warring between these two different identities and I feel like that's why I've always connected to her and there are some issues where I read where she's very down on herself and I know I get like that and not to make it sad but like it really was nice to see a character I'm like oh she's sad and emo like me and warring between <laughs> these two different identities like like it, it really just hit home with me so that's why I've really like gun for Jessica Drew and I love her dearly so I'm really glad that we're going to see her in the Spider-Verse. And it feels like a dream come true, even though I'm not playing her. It's like a dream come true seeing her being played, or at least voicing, by a black woman. Well, hey, we might have to do some, like, Spider-Woman fanfic where you get to be Spider-Woman. You know, like, there's no there's no law <laughs> against that. As we, uh, That'd be fun. Like a fan, fanfic voiceover kind of thing. This on Marvel Ultimate Alliance wanted to the greatest video superhero video games ever made. Invisible Woman is also really powerful in that game. She yes. would make a team with like Invisible Woman and Captain Marvel and Spider Woman and Elektra. I think that might be the strongest all woman team. My the guy <sighs> character I always picked was the Human Torch. I was like, all right, <laughs> he is also pretty kick ass in that game. I wanted to say a thing about Spider Woman. I remember when she started to resurge and be in um, be in the Avengers all the time. You know, like Spider Man, she yeah. wasn't always part of the Avengers. I mean, there was a bit of a controversy because as she became more used character, like, um, she was she was always kind of sexualized. There was this kind of... Or because she's always just drawn as this total babe. And they added possibly this thing about her pheromone powers, which involve your, you know, being able to attract people yes, and distract them, yeah. which is kind of like... Uh, weird genderized you know femme fatale kind of power but like i think bendis came up with that i think it works though for her too oh no like it worked it's, yeah. a, it's an interesting thing it's an interesting dynamic that she can use tactically i was wondering how you felt about that like i mean for a while there was a joke in the comic cons like <laughs> spider one was one of those characters that no matter how she was drawn you could always see her boobs Sorry, like just from what whatever angle, like even if like clearly we're looking at her for the back, somehow the artist managed to include, uh, you know, her curvy boobs. It she was kind of drawn like that. And and to add to the just kind of over sexualization of the character, I mean, I think for you know when when Spider Woman was last in the cultural zeitgeist, I think it was around the time where uh, I believe it was the artist Milo Minara drew a controversial cover. Where she was basically like, yeah. you know, splayed out like a, you know, a adult model and and drawn like like you to your point, drawn very sexual, and 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 it wasn't just that; it was also like the defiance of the artist and and then people saying, well, you know, that artist is known for drawing like over sexualized characters to begin with, and if you hire the guy, you shouldn't get mad that he's going to give you like a over sexualized you know cover and it was like around the time of like you know people finally calling out like cheesecake in comics right yeah so i just wanted to add that to the conversation since you brought up like the over sexualized nature of the character again a character i'm not familiar with i remember speak I, I thought she had a dope costume ever you know always just i just remember from when like the old like 70s cartoon but yeah, yeah i don't Brittany, what what do you think of of like that 
take on on the character and and comics was like kind of a boys club in a way where they did you know she wasn't the only one they got over sexualized and in, in the way she, she was drawn. a similar thing when they started oh, you know yeah. uh, casting her a lot too <laughs> it's like i don't know because i really do like the classic costume but i feel like the classic costume is just so easy to sexualize and that's the problem because that costume is really cool, but yeah, it's just so like quick to sexualize it. That's why I kind of like the one that Chris Anka came up with—the like street level motor jacket and like the leather oh, yeah, like yeah. stretchy looking pants. Like that suit, I like, but I just I love the classic. But it's so like sexualized, and um, yeah, I don't know because I, at the same time I'm like eh, it's not practical. But then like they're superheroes, so they're not practical anyway. So there's that like boring like thing too because like if they adapt angela into the live action i'm like no put her in some chain mill booty shorts but <laughs> like hmm. i know there's people who are like no that's not practical but it looks it's a cool look so i don't know but it can get <laughs> too much where you're like mm, no <laughs> you mean marvel angela yes or, sorry oh the... she's also very powerful in the video game <laughs> yeah. and yes where's chain mail booty shorts <laughs> well i mean that's always been the kind of debate as it were like there were and we're talking about good faith debate right because there's always the bad faith debate but like Mm -hmm. the notion that superheroes in general are these like idealized physical specimens that you know whether it's captain america or spider woman or whoever they're wearing these skin tight costumes that show everything Mm -hmm. but i think that you know the double standard has always been and i think this was um Noel Stevenson's Hawkeye project from a few years ago. Noel Stevenson, who famously uh, rebooted She-Ra for Netflix, they put out you know this project on the internet. I think it was Tumblr at the time, where basically draw male superheroes the way female mm-hmm. superheroes oh, yeah. are often depicted in, <laughs> and it's look and it's ridiculous. And I think that's the point, right? The point of the mm-hmm. Hawkeye project was to show Hawkeye and all these ridiculous cheesecake poses where like you stick your butt out and you turn your back and like the women are always depicted like that and the men are and the men are powerful and and but never never kind of like submissive and that's always i think the the big difference and that minara cover of spider woman is very like her ass is sticking out and you can like see every orifice (laughs) through her costume Yeah, that that is cheesecake that is for sure and i but i do think it's an interesting discussion on in like the history of representation and the progress of representation because i think what happened and you know in like the early aughts is that they wanted to increase representation of the woman characters and they had all these legacy woman characters spider woman and she hulk and so they started using them in the avengers a lot more but i think because it was still a boys club from the creator standpoint they sort of fell on that on their own habits of cheesecake and we're going to give her like special sexy woman powers. And so maybe that was sort of a turning point when we got past what it's both representation and interpretation when he says, OK, well, we're both going to have these characters in there, but we're also going to have people <laughs> interpret them in a new way. So we're not just doing cheesecake over and over again. And then you have so that you have things like, oh, like She-Hulk finally stopped being like <laughs> sort of an Amazon proportioned woman and they start like drawing her like Hulk you know like she really bulks out now like she's like a womanly monster which is interesting so I mean all this to say I think I I think I hope they don't shy away from it I think it's an interesting character dynamic about Jessica Drew that she is a really sexy powerful person and I hope they play into that or address it somehow in the Spider-Verse sequel. And I think what you were saying, Brittany, there is a way to still be sex positive, right? Because it's not like Mm -hmm. there's anything inherently wrong with being sexual as a character. Yeah, or as a person, too. I mean, like, follow my Twitter. (laughs) I mean, I feel like there's nothing wrong with it, but there's I think when people don't know how to ground it, and if sometimes it's overdone where it's like, no, it feels... To, I feel like it's more of the male perspective of what women's sexuality should be. Right. And it's, yeah, there are some women who do like wearing booty shorts and things like that. And that's fine. Like, I'm all for it if that's what you personally want to wear. But I think there's also this idea of, like, that's the automatic thing that makes a woman sexy or something like that. It's the male gaze aspect yeah. is what's bothersome of the way women are depicted in comics, right? It's not necessarily, like, to your point, like, yeah, Angela fully covered would be weird. Even Wonder Woman, right? Like, there's this whole, like, Wonder Woman should wear pants. Like, 
Wonder Woman doesn't need to wear pants, but she should be depicted in a powerful way, the way Superman is depicted. And, you know, it doesn't make sense for Wonder Woman to be, like, demure and submissive because she's fucking Wonder Woman, right? Yeah, and I, I want to see a Wonder Woman who actually has, like, Serena Williams' body type. Right. Like, she doesn't have to be black, obviously, but, like, just having, like, Serena Williams' body type. Like, to me, that makes sense for Wonder Woman. And there's people that are like, <laughs> but I'm just like, but it makes sense for her. Like, I don't understand it. Like, ugh. yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's ultimately the, the big distinction is, is who are you, who's doing it and who are they doing it for? And clearly like there is a way to draw characters sexy without being exploitative. And mm-hmm. I think for the longest time, like the Frank Cho's and the Milo Minara's of the world tend to err on the side of exploitative and not powerful right and i think that's that's a difference because i remember when people lost their shit when uh they redesigned batgirl's costume you know Mm -hmm. and it was like she was wearing combat boots and a you know less form-fitting costume and people lost their shit and it's like well you know she's also like 17 in the comics now or whatever it is you know what i mean i don't know yeah yeah to be fair i think it's fairly hard to find someone with Serena Williams body type. I mean, they, that doesn't well, just like happen every day. She works. Yeah, you know? like, but I mean, the thing is... I, that, that's I, like an amazing feat of like training. I think the issue too is the idea that actors don't look like that, but they are. Just they don't get cast because of their body type because it's like... That's the issue that I think a lot of people don't realize. There's actors who are out there, they're undiscovered, who have these body types who could probably, especially women, who could be superheroes... Or play action roles, but people are like, no, they're not sexy enough because they look like that. And then when you need a yeah. character who it makes sense for them to have that body type, they still go out and find like a really tiny, petite, like actress. And that's the issue, too, is that there, and then there's this constant going around of, well, actors don't look like that. There's no actresses who look like her. It's like, well, because you're not casting them. That's and at the, the same problem. time, they, right. And then, but again, it's a double standard because then you take a doughy actor like, fucking peter quill what's his, uh, you take a doughy actor like chris pratt and you and you put him through the ringer to make him all buff or even as much as i love kumail nanjiani like that dude did never look yeah. like that before <laughs> right yeah. before he did the marvel workout <laughs> you know or even like hugh jackman if you go back and watch like the first x-men movie he has like a normal human's body even though he's shirtless mm-hmm. all the time in that first x-men movie and at some point between 2000 and 2018 or whatever it was like no superheroes must look this way <laughs> and now he looks mm-hmm. like you know a creatine monster and it's like you know i think there is this unrealistic because they're superheroes there's this unrealistic kind of expectation but to your point the double standard is that men get to bulk out and get to like be buff and whatever and then women just aren't allowed that opportunity because once you are you know it's to your point it's like well that's not what certain people consider attractive so we're not going to go that or they get to be chubby thor in endgame which is like a big gag of like oh that's unusual and funny <laughs> i mean you know they they didn't let you know scarlett johansson like yeah, I let it all out for a couple of years. Right. <laughs> but anyway. no, of course not. And that's, I think, the issue, too. And even, like, there's actresses who are really tall that they try to hide their height. Like, Elizabeth Debicki, I think that's how you say your last <laughs> yeah, name. Yeah. That woman yeah. is, like, 6'3", maybe 6'4". And there's only, like, maybe one or two, like, projects that, like, I think that she's looked her actual height where everything else, she does it. And that's another issue is, like... When it comes to body types on actors and yep, that's the insecurity for co-stars, right? Like it's the it's the Tom Cruise complex, right? Like he can't, he's never been the same height as any of his co-stars. Like he's face to face with fucking Henry Cavill yep. in Mission Impossible, and it's like Henry Cavill's at least a foot taller than you, dude. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I will say that that uh, shout out to Chris Nolan for Tenet because that was like one of the only movies that let Elizabeth Debicki be tall because there's a whole. Yes scene that is dependent on her being tall because she's tied up in the back seat and there's no driver in the car and it's spiraling out of control and she's able to, to like reach the, the front of the car from the back seat because she's seven feet tall so like it's like mm-hmm. hashtag let elizabeth the becky be tall is uh is definitely and she's awesome like I, I wish she was cast in more things to be honest yeah and like even like Gwendolyn Christie we know she's tall and they found I, I that's one of the things I do appreciate about Game of Thrones even though there's other issues there but they actually found a woman who is like really tall to play Breen 
but I want to see her do other stuff where mm. she's soft and like I think this idea too of right. like tall woman can't be soft and romantic interest is also like another issue for me because I feel like Gwendolyn would be so fun in a romantic comedy and I don't yeah. know if she'll ever get that chance and that breaks my heart. I saw Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman once in person when they were married. Yeah, she is like seven yeah. feet tall. Especially but compared but, to him. Or, or, right, or not. But it's just like, <laughs> right. yeah, in comparison to him, like, it's it's very jarring. <laughs> it's funny. But she did, she did all right. So I think there's hope there. <laughs> yeah, but going back, just just to, to, to go back and, and, and uh, close the loop on Spider-Woman, what what is your, like, feeling about Issa Rae as Jessica Drew? Because, again, that casting alone has gotten me. It's not that I wasn't interested in Spider-Verse 2. I was. But, like, now I'm like, holy shit, when is this movie coming out? Because, to your point, Brittany, Issa Rae is one of the best, just, not even actors, best people out there right now. Just the, everything mm-hmm. she touches is gold. And and to have her be part of a superhero property is, like, chef's kiss. So, like, what, 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 about, what about just the casting of Issa Rae has got you excited? I really liked her work because i watched um the uh, web series she did a long time ago which is the misadventures of an awkward black girl i loved that and i'm behind on insecure but i did at least watch the first two seasons and she's so great and then the movie she did with marseille what is that movie called is it called grown or up the one where like oh yeah yeah where they Hmm. swap the body swap movie yeah um that one she's so good in that and then if you haven't seen the photograph with her and lakeith Lakeith steinfeld yeah oh that's so good and i wish we had more movies like that for like people of color yeah not just black people but all people of color i mentioned camille earlier uh-huh. the lovebirds is a great movie yes that movie's good too so everything i've seen her and she's very good and she has a range of like you know we know that she's one of those actors who's got the range and jessica drew is such a character that like she like i said she has her moments where she's very down on herself and like is just not in a good place and then she can be like the funniest cheese ball in the world and i love her and she loves cheeseburgers and like i, I don't know i just want to see like where she goes and and, and you know, raise a type of actress that i can't imagine that they would cast her even in an animated project and then make her voice a white character like i just can't imagine Issa Rae being cool with that you know what i mean that's why i don't I think so. they're gonna go that route so you're betting on Black Spider definitely because yeah. like okay. Issa Rae would yeah, I, like I think, I think so Issa too. Rae would just be like why why Which are you making cool. me voice as white woman because the the optics of that already is problematic yeah. too you know what I mean yeah but like even then just like people's reaction of her just voicing the character which we don't know which way it's going which obviously I'm hoping that yes she will actually be drawn black as well but even if she mm. wasn't just like Issa Rae voicing her is not that big of a deal i think especially when she is a character who is boring with her identities and that's something that i think a lot of people if you are not a cis straight white person like you know you do war with your identities like just because of the way you are treated for your identities so i just feel like anyone who that's how i feel like i feel like anyone who isn't like an other like you know marginalized yeah. somehow playing jessica drew was uh, i feel like it doesn't fit that for the character but i also feel like we we speaking of a reckoning i think we're in a place now that like even for animated projects voice actors should match the yeah. the characters and vice versa because like for so long in voice acting it's been like white people get to voice everyone and and we're starting to see that change where like you know that filipino anime i was talking about on netflix for the dub they've cast Mm -hmm. all filipino american actors there's a korean dub that's casting korean american actors to do an english dub you know they cast an asian american woman to play lois lane in the new superman cartoon and they made the character look asian even though lois lane is usually kind of asian and i think to dominic's point Mm -hmm. earlier like any brunette character in comics is usually depicted very Asian anyway. Just, yeah, I think she just... has like, so like <laughs> Asian flavor going but there. But I, I do think there is a, we, we are entering a, a, you know, equity in voice acting stage as well, where like voice actors are playing characters of, of similar race, if not the same race, but. Yeah, but I want to say this is an interesting reverse case. And like, and why I'm not going to be mad if, you know, Spider-Woman is still white is it's sort of letting, you know, non-white actors take up more space and do things they you know they that would be unheard of before either way either way it's it's interesting and new and something that has that in the comics all right you know like black woman voicing the white character or the black woman voicing a black spider woman that spider woman has never been black before mm-hmm. so either way there's some interesting dynamic that happens and 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 i'm just i i'm a little 
hesitant about like getting into the like sheer one to one authenticity argument, sure. <laughs> you know, because although I mean it's a really good discussion to have, but like you know, like for a- Asians again, right? Yeah. Well, it just rare it ever goes the other direction. I mean, like I, other than Phil Lamar and Chris Summer, you know, non white voice actors rarely get to play white characters a white person yeah or, or yeah. non non-black characters right like Cree summer has played every race in in animated projects phil lamar has played every race in animated projects mm. but that's not they're the exceptions to the rule the the rule in animation in america has been white people like you know i'm gonna get some heat for this maybe but like i'm one of the few people who don't give avatar its flowers just because it's you know, so many people, maybe it's, I'm a different generation too, but like, mm-hmm. it's a show created by white people, voiced by white people, except Dante Bosco, right? Like, sure. yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it, a it very, very you know, it's a very white show. And it's a very like, you know, my, my brother, he and I talk about this all the time. Like, it's pretty fucking appropriative too, right? Like, it's like a bunch of white people, like, let's take Buddhism and martial arts and make this fantasy world without any Asian oh, people, right. you know, input. And it's, you know, like, but for some fucking reason, Asians love that shit. So I can't say this <laughs> on the internet all it's the time. It's particularly well done in that case. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I get you. I totally get you. No, so. I always had that issue, too. Even though I liked it a lot, I still like that show a lot. It's one of my favorite shows, not going to lie. But I always no, had that I mean, issue. Fine, like, I saying, was just yeah. like, well, why is the only the villain being voiced by, which I mean, he ends up turning, he ends up having a really sure. great, he has one of the best, I think, re- villain redemption arcs ever in like recent memory. But yeah, it was just always interesting to me. I'm like, why is he the only like a person of color like voicing a main character, and he's the only like Asian actor I think besides the it wasn't the original Iro voice actor though. Yeah, Not yeah, Iroh. Ma- uh, Mako yeah, Iroh, was, yeah. yeah. But still, it was just like only they. It was very. Mm. Yeah, you know, but, it's just, it's just like it. white show creator. And that's why it was a little tricky, too, when the live action, you know, the white show creators kind of like got booted off the live action reboot. And like, you that's know, I'm, like, I'm wondering. I'm, but they also got, you know, it was like Asian American showrunners got, re- they, they were the ones who replaced them. So I'm just like, I'm not mad at it. But, you know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not an avatar. I'm not but an avatar head to begin with. So I have also heard is because they didn't want the uh zatara ship to happen and i think oh, zatara well. ship's gonna happen in the live action and i'm like you know what if them leaving means i finally get zatara then i don't care because i <laughs> want zatara i'm i don't care i'm a zatara shipper nothing anyone will say will like convince me otherwise i am just that's my ship so before we get to what's nerd popping i did want to touch on two other DC things just to kind of balance all of this Marvel mm-hmm. talk. <laughs> the other things that, that kind of dropped this week were like really short teases. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but we got our first look at Shazam Fury of the Gods in this like five second kind of humorous teaser that David Sandberg tweeted out where you got to see Zachary Levi in the new costume. I think there were some leaked photos as well. It's mm-hmm. definitely a different costume than what he wore in the first movie. It looks a lot more, uh, let's say professional in the first movie's costume. Mm. And then there was a, a t- speaking mm. of uh, superhero directors, Andy Muschietti, the director of the flash movie, which is not called flashpoint, I guess tweeted mm. out a costume as well, but he didn't tweet out the flashes costume. He tweeted out Michael Keaton's Batman costume with some blood splatter on it. So did you guys see these two costume teases for the next DC properties? And what did you think of both? I only saw the Shazam one because I think if I saw the Batman one, it was an edit with, uh, it said like the Flash and then it was like the edit of uh, Michael Keaton, Robert Pattinson, and then I think Ben Affleck on the the (laughs) cover. And I was just like, oh, this is really going to be a Batman movie, isn't it? (laughs) But that's what everyone's been saying. So that's the only thing I've technically seen of Michael Keaton involved with that movie. But I saw the Shazam one and I'm very excited because I really liked Shazam, those are my babies, so <laughs> I'm excited to see my babies again. Um, I cry every time I watch that movie. I've seen that movie like 20 times already, and I like... It's a good wow. movie. I literally cry every time I watch that movie. I love that movie. I have zero opinion on Shazam, so I'll leave that to you <laughs> two folks. I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it. I have zero big idea on Shazam, the character, or the movies. Uh, that Batman symbol that was in the image, he tweeted out an image of Batman's 1989 chest symbol right with like a dash of blood on it exactly the 92 one but uh wow. but yeah yeah wow specificity <laughs> <laughs> <Action figure. laughs> the collector it was really okay 
Because I thought it was... Well, okay. just so for what it's worth, I mean, I'm being a bit facetious, but not really. The, the 89 bat logo has two extra prongs on the middle scallop. Man, and then the 92 the Batman Returns has the more traditional bat logo on his bat costume. But please continue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for explaining the prongs. <laughs> prong spleener no no i'm glad <laughs> i'm glad to know but i think it's fair to say that was the last time they went with the full like raised like the emblem is like a bright thing on the chest thing like it's, it's, yeah i haven't had a yellow know, bat in a long haven't time had, like that big symbol um anyway uh but a lot of people pointed this out already it evokes the main symbol from watchmen which is a smiley face with a clock hand dash of blood on it which is like a you know, the controlling image of the Watchmen series and is somewhat in the movies and the TV show. So I, that was very interesting. Didn't you think that was interesting? Yeah, what do you think Moschetti's trying to convey with the very Watchmen-esque tease? Batman's watching. The first image, any official image from his Flash movie being a Batman costume. Like, what? What? what yeah, what do there's you no think Flash it, in there at all, right? No, not at all. Not even a hint. I think it's because they know that people are still mm, about Ezra because of him That's pushing true. that fan and stuff. So I feel like that's also why maybe we're going to get more Batman hype from that. Just because of, <laughs> they're like, oh, let's not try to hype Ezra. So people Which is going to be hard since movie. he's the fucking star of the movie. I know. I'm not, a big, not a big fan of him as Flash anyway. I don't. So I don't know. Again, this might be DC like laying another huge trap for themselves. I don't know. They. Uh, I mean, I'm not even talking about his personal behavior. I'm just like, I'm not a huge yeah. fan of him as, as the Flash. No, I get it. Um, I do think, and maybe it's just because I've spent more time with him as the flash is grant gustin to me is just like he's the flash yeah <laughs> like, i have to admit I've, I've been less impressed with him this most recent season i i feel like uh i don't know if it's just because they're you know shooting post pandemic episodes and stuff and everyone's kind of like just you know after a year off not in the groove but i don't know there's something about the flash cast this season they, they just don't feel like their hearts in it i don't know if you've been keeping up with it this year i'm a little bit behind i haven't I think the last episode I watched was when Cisco and I can't remember the new guy's name. They went into like Chester. the ninety Chester. I loved that episode, by the way. They went into like the nineties. Yeah, that was a really fun episode for me. I really liked it, but that's like the last episode I've watched yeah. of this uh, current season. Yeah, apologies to your other podcast family, Brittany, but I'm not feeling the flash this season. <laughs> no, I, I kind of want to put. Them, I want them to be put out of their misery, and you know, Carlos is leaving too. So it's, yeah, you know, Tom's already gone. So it's almost like. That's two reasons that I would come back, and if they're not coming back, I'm not sure I'm coming back next season, but anyway. Well, next season is the last season. Is it officially the final season? Yeah, I think so. That's That sounds like that's it. But I hope they will end on a high note since they're actually prepared to know that this is the last season, unlike Black Lightning. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just going to be bitter about that. Of course, forever. you should be. Hmm. Yeah, but... I don't know. The Grant is to me is still just like he's the like he's the Flash, and besides Michael Rosenbaum, obviously, you know he's just he's the Flash. I mean, if it's a multiversal movie, which it is supposed to be, since it's bringing Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton together, like it's canonical that Grant Gustin knows Ezra Miller's Flash, right? Like, so it's not far fetched that, that you may see a Grant Gustin cameo in the Flashpoint movie. You said there was some uneasiness on the title. Do you do you think they'll go as far as to just rebrand it another Batman movie? Like is that the kind of <laughs> weird loop that you see? Batman you see colon the Flash, <laughs> right? Or or Batman versus Flash? You know, Sunrise of Justice or whatever. Batman versus Flash: Dawn of the Multiverse. That's what I'll call it. Oh Dawn. There, there we go. That's what we're talking about. Because yeah. I mean, I'm being facetious, but we also know. DC's fallback is to put Batman in everything. Put <laughs> Batman forward everything is the thing they know that works. Batman is the rock of the DC universe because that used to be like the Hollywood formula. Is like, oh, your franchise yeah. is failing. Put the rock in it. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Batman has that rock-like power. <laughs> and they might, they might do it again. Yeah, and the rock's in the DC universe now, so... No, but I like that. I actually prefer your title, Batman vs. Flash, Sunset of Justice, because it's the end. Yeah, Let, <laughs> let's continue whatever they were talking about. Justice dawned, that. and now it's sunsetting. Yeah, or, you know, early afternoon tea, whatever <laughs> time of justice it is, so we can make it a trilogy, but... I'm gonna spit out my coffee, oh my god. It's okay, as long as you're in a safe place and don't hurt your microphone. Yes. <laughs> so we'll leave it there. Brittany, what's nerd popping? Nerd popping for me, besides obviously Issa Rae being of Jessica course. Drew. 
I don't know if it's nerd popping because I'm kind of sad about it, but I'm the only one who's sad about it is Jupiter's Legacy got canceled. <laughs> and, I mean, I think the only tweets people have probably seen me about the show is like, ooh, all the men on the show are hot. So they're probably like, pretty only cares because of the hot men. But I actually liked watching it. It was fun. I mean, me Tad Hamilton's a part it. of your family, right? Yes, Tad Hamilton is like a crucial to our family. So <laughs> it's so hmm. sad. But like, uh, whatever. As long as, you know, Matt Latner goes off and does something else. Uh, I just loved his work on Clone Wars. Clone, Clone Wars. Clone Wars is Anakin. <laughs> but I guess that's kind of it. Your nerd popping has come full circle because I think a couple weeks ago your nerd popping was just Jupiter's legacy and now it's Jupiter's legacy's cancellation. So I'm. Yeah, and that's its legacy. That's, yeah. It's, that is, I guess that's its legacy. But what is a legacy? <laughs> It's planting oh, trees. I'm yeah. excited. Speaking of that, real quick, I'm seeing that's gonna be my first movie back in theaters. It's gonna be in the Heights. I'm nice. kind of just, like oh. nervous because I'm like, do I eat snacks or just keep my <laughs> mask on the whole time? Like, I don't know because I feel like going to a restaurant is I feel a little bit more safe taking off my mask for a second. But the theater, I don't know. Mm. I'm nervous. Well, do you plan to go to one of those multiplexes or like a dedicated like one screen kind of big theater? I'm just curious. I don't know because I'm going with my friend and she lives in Alhambra, so I'm probably meeting her out that way. So we're going to one of the theaters in. Yeah, are you seeing it in IMAX? Right? There for sure. Um, I don't know. You should see it in IMAX. Right Okay, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Dominic, what's nerd popping? Yeah, I, I think Netflix is still angling for what their superhero piece of the pie is going to be, and they'll, they'll come up with something. But anyway, I don't have much nerd popping this week, except the Suns beat the Lakers, which I just think <laughs> is cool because it's not nerd popping at all, but I really don't like the Lakers. And for those who are tracking kind of Chris Paul's, like I root for Chris Paul's arc and, you know, the grand NBA narrative. I want him to get to the finals those days. I don't know if you feel that way about chris paul i don't i don't have a particular love for chris paul necessarily but i do like lebron's one of those people who like i want to hate and i do like on the court but like as a human being (laughs) i think he's i think he is the goat as like the like the best person to ever play oh he's a great guy yeah but i just for some reason on the court i can't stand him and i think it's because you know i'm a michael jordan guy Right. Like I'm just by dent of generation. Sure. And to see like all of Michael's not that he's like taking down any of Michael's records, but like Michael's kind of place in the firmament of NBA history being lessened because of LeBron. Maybe that's what it like. You know, I mentioned earlier that uh, before we started recording, when you wanted to talk with us, like, well, LeBron is in Space Jam. So like (laughs) it is a roundabout kind of nerdy thing to be talking about. But but even then, like LeBron (laughs) Space Jam actor, LeBron James, but even LeBron being in Space (laughs) Jam to me diminishes the greatness of uh, the first Space Jam movie. (laughs) You are in the cult. I'm sorry. I am. I'm a I'm a Jordan. This is the kind of shit that will get you killed, honestly. But is it fair to say that like LeBron is a better guy than Michael Jordan. A in human my opinion, being, he is, yes. Well, that's as my point. Being. Like as a person, yeah. <laughs> right? Like because LeBron actually donates money to causes. LeBron will actually speak out against injustice, yeah. where Michael never did. And of course, like the '90s was different, right? Like the expectations of athletes in the '90s was different. But and I'm not a Jordan. Okay, I am a Jordan apologist. But <laughs> you so are. Yeah, that's clearly classic yeah, but... <laughs> American thing to do. So, so, but that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, for some reason, I can't get past rooting against LeBron on the court. Like, I was, right. I would be much happier to like if LeBron had never won a title <laughs> and just had all these great stats, but like could, couldn't win. Like that narrative, it's a problematic narrative. I understand, and most people who hate LeBron do so in an irrational way. And I'm not saying my way is rational either, <laughs> but I just. I like the guy. Like, I just wish he was worse at basketball. That's all. Yeah. No, no. Again, we can have nuanced opinions about things. <laughs> He's a great guy. Hate him on the basketball court. And I hate the Lakers for not not a good reason. There are no, there are no like, rational reasons to like or dislike things in sports. I just hate the Lakers. Yeah. And, of course, we had that whole thing with the Warriors. He was our main, you know. Right. He was the dark side to our Warriors Justice League for a long time. So that's where we built up that. But anyway, what's nerd popping, Keith? Well, my nerd popping is very similar to uh, Brittany's. I'm very excited for In the Heights now coming out on Thursday. It is very different i'll put this out there it's very different from the stage show so if you're familiar with the stage show the essence is there and Brittany, how familiar are you with the stage version 
Um, like I've only heard the actual sound, like the, the album cast recording. Yeah, I've yeah. never actually seen it, which I want to see it. Right. I don't know when it's ever well, happen, I mean, that's part of the but... problem is that it, like it's not touring. It ha- it's not been revived in like several years. Like the last performance of In the Heights was something Glenn and I talked about in our interview mm-hmm. uh, was when it played the Kennedy Center a couple years ago where Anthony Ramos played Usnavi. And that, I think, was the last time it was ever performed. And hopefully, and I wish I got a chance to ask Lynn this, you know, with the movie coming out, will they revive the show and, and put it out on tour? Because I do think he mentioned this because there are characters that have been excised from the movie and oh. plot lines that have been removed okay. from the movie that uh, and, and, and in addition, songs that belong to those characters and those plot lines that have been removed from the movie. And some of those songs are some of my favorite songs in the show. So I was a little bitter about it. (laughs) But that that said, he, he mentioned in the, in the interview that when you see the the show, those will still be there. And it's kind of like what I always say about adaptation, right? Like no one's going in there and tearing up your old copies of uh, a Spider-Man issue number 75, right? Like whatever they change, those things are still going to be there. Iron Fist is still going to be white in the comics, right? And and Camila is still going to be in, in the Heights if you go to the show. But if you go to the movie, she won't be there, right? And that's... Yeah. But all that said, John Chu's direction is... That's why I asked you to see it on an IMAX screen. Because, like, okay. the colors... I want him to do Hamilton. <laughs> I know they've talked about it. I hope he does. Because, like, that's what I just really want to hear right-hand man... And actual cannons and stuff firing when it's happening. Like, I need it. <laughs> cannons. There you go. All right. Well, that's Hard Knock Life for this week. Brittany, how can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and whatnot at Hi Brittany Monet. The Black Lightning podcast is basically pretty much done. We're going to actually record our very last, last episode, I think, tomorrow. You can follow us at BL underscore podcast. And I do this one and eventually, you know, they're going to announce. Uh, well, I've kind of said it on here. I'm basically <laughs> going to be doing the Naomi podcast, <laughs> part of DC TV podcast, which hasn't been officially announced, but you guys heard it first. So, Ooh, cool. yeah, <laughs> please don't don't come after us, Andy. I've already shit on the Flash show and, and stepped on your <laughs> announcements. And we've made an enemy out of Andy on this episode of. But, I mean, you know, I feel like it's obvious if you have not paid attention to my social media and me posting about a certain comic I bought. Like, Will that you know? take over the BL Podcast feed or will it be a whole yes, new... Yes, so that's okay. what's going to be happening. So if you're already subscribed to the Black Lightning Podcast, it's going to be that feed. And there's... So it's going to remain all of the previous episodes of the Black Lightning Podcast will be on there. Naomi cool. will be on there. And then we are going to do uh, the Lituation Room, which is going to basically be... Everyone who is a host on the Black Lightning podcast coming back and talking about anything uh, nerd on basically through like, you know, black, the black culture. And that's also on the same feed. Yes, it will all be on the same feed as the Naomi podcast. So cool. That's what's kind of happening. We haven't officially announced that, but I've announced it. So that's what's happening, guys. A scoop. It's leaked. (laughs) Dominic, how can people find you? I'm Dama, D-O-M-M-A-H, on Instagram or Twitter, and that's it. You can find me on Twitter at the real Chow, the underscore real underscore Chow, and now you can find me on Instagram at real Keith Chow. Also follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color, and go to hardknockmedia.com to find this and all the podcasts in the Hard Knock family, including my brand new podcast, Shelf Conscious, where I get to talk about the only thing I really care about, action figures and toys. The most recent episode, I talked to the legendary Larry Hama about the origins of G.I. Joe, and check that out at hardknockmedia.com slash shelfconscious. Subscribe and download where you download and subscribe to this podcast on all of your favorite podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Support us on patreon.com slash nerds of colors. Buy merchandise at T Public. Find us on GoFundMe. And uh, basically give us money and we'll keep doing these things for you. And until next time. Flash. Ta-da. He saved every one of us. What is that? Is that a thing? That's from, that's Queen's Flash Gordon theme, man. Oh, I didn't, didn't know that that was. Oh, well, it's I'm not like I wasn't singing it very well, but because Flash. 
Okay, oh, okay, now I do know that. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, don't make me sing the whole song. I will. <laughs> it's only two minutes long. <laughs> we'll get a copyright strike. See you, everybody. See ya.